The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Alright, hey. Shh. Thank you. <laughs> All right, folks, I'm Alan Hicks. If you don't know me by now, where the hell have you been? Uh, I do a lot of stuff. I'm an assisted man. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much me. Also, I'm sexy. Uh, so, you know, just so you know. So this is going to be all about varnish. Uh, I started using varnish a year ago, maybe. Maybe not that long. Not entirely sure. Before that, we had all kind of jacked up solutions to all kind of jacked up CMSs, and varnish really uh, streamlined things, made su made stuff so much simpler that uh, you know it's just been like night and day since we started using it. So, a little bit about content management systems. They suck. Can we all agree on that? They suck. There are no good content management systems. Some are worse than others, but there's no good one. I don't care if it's Drupal, Joomla, WordPress, what, they suck, you know. Uh, and all the traditional performance improvements that people use for them suck. I mean, they're awful. Let's take a look at some of them. You know, you've got the horrible coding in your CMS. Has anyone looked at a CMS and said, my God, this is beautiful code? Has anyone in the history of humanity ever done that? Yes. Liar. <laughs> they have horrible SQL. And I mean, seriously, have you looked at the SQL code in them? It's ugly, you know, it's huge, it's ugly, they're bad. They have poor I.O. performance, often because they just have too many damn files. They just make bad decisions all around. Or they make not good decisions. Uh, so let's take a look at the code, you know, traditional code in your databases, uh, you know, even your wikis, whatever. They have unoptimized code in most situations, uh, and there are some good reasons for this to some extent. A lot of them are written to run on every damn thing from Windows to Linux to OS 10 to, to whatever, and, uh, you know, they use every possible database storage from flat files to MySQL to Postgres to Oracle to SQL Server to what have you. Uh, the old BSD flat file file system I see sometimes. Uh, then there's others that are written to run on only one system and they do it poorly. Uh, I'm looking at UV Bulletin. Uh, that's, you know, made to run with just this one particular type of setup and it's only ever made to run on one server at a time. You try and throw it on multiple servers, you run into all kinds of issues. Uh, many, here's looking at you, WordPress, are made to be run by idiots. Uh, these are people who have, you know, no computer training. They should not be allowed to touch a web server, and yet they have their own blog. Uh, and then many have limited functionality without adding dozens of crappy third-party plugins. That's also you, WordPress, and Drupal, and pretty much every other CMS, right? I mean, the whole idea of CMSs these days is they're all written modularly, and the base thing gets a little bit done, but if you want to actually do anything really useful, you have to start throwing on these third-party modules. If you start getting a lot of hits, suddenly this you know, poorly written code that somebody chewed up in their mom's basement uh, just doesn't hold up when it starts getting thousands of hits, you know, an hour, let alone thousands of hits a minute. So they start writing these third-party codes to improve, these third-party plugins to improve the code base, and you're just adding code instead of fixing the real damn problem. So you look at your databases. Databases suck. The traditional fix is Throw more money at it. Let's get more faster CPUs. Let's get more RAM. Let's you know, get a new box. Let's add two of them. Uh, and that's generally not the best solution. Yes, sometimes your database is just overworked because you have so much data. It, you have to do so much data processing. 
you need a lot of stuff for that. CMS is generally not. Uh, CMSs tend to do a lot of repetitive stuff, and because of that, and the way their SQL code is written, it's huge, it has all kinds of joins and whatnot, they tend to perform poorly. So the problem typically ain't a lack of resources. It's a combination of you know, latency going to the database and just ugly SQL piled on top of even uglier SQL and fixing the real problem goes back to fixing the code, which was our previous slide, which, you know, even more difficult. So then you have kludges like memcache, NoSQL, all these things that basically uh, they work like a dictionary. You know, some your code, which now is running a third-party plugin to interface with memcache because God forbid that be written into the actual, you know, the base code. So now you've got this third-party code that's interfacing with memcache that's adding some additional overhead. Memcache is interfacing with a database. You know, you, uh, you talk to memcache first, you say, hey, do you know what this is? And memcache says no. Then you talk to the database server, you tell it run this three-page uh, SQL statement with 50 joins and, you know, a dozen selects and get the result and then you talk to memcache again and tell it, hey, store A as this huge result. And then you look it up again. And that does help, provided you can store A inside memcache and it's always in there and it updates, you know, semi-frequently uh, so that, you know, you're not storing stale content. You know, it expires on a, a decent basis. Then you've got load balancing servers, you know, like, well, one isn't enough, let's run two of them. Because, you know, two is better than one at all times, right? And so then, you know, that isn't good enough, so let's start sharding our data. Let's put some of our data over here on this server, and some of our data on this server, and some of our data on this server, and let's run the SQL queries against, and it's just an ungodly nightmare. It's just bad. Uh, if you're Facebook, yes, you need to shard your data. I'm sorry, but your grandmother's recipes on her blog do not need sharded data. Uh, they just add complexity, they make the system more fragile. Imagine, you know, you start getting writes on this server and this server over here is clogged up with reads and its write takes longer to accomplish and it's just a nightmare. It's a mess. So, IO performance. Why do CMSs suck with this and how do we get better at it? Uh, many of these systems make hundreds of thousands of files. I've personally uh, seen, you know, CMSs that, especially when you start allow user uploads like we do at work for things like the uh, North American Whitetail Plus app where people, you know, post a picture of the dead deer I killed. Yay! Uh, and then, you know, you suddenly you're getting a hundred of these a day during deer season and you know each one gets a high resolution, a thumbnail, a medium resolution, something for the retina display and so suddenly you have you know thousands of files just laying around that have to be read constantly. So uh, user uploads exacerbate the problem like I just said. Now imagine we have multiple web servers. Instead of just having one we have four now or we have a dozen all of those need to access those same uh, files. So how do you get that done? Traditionally, you use NFS, which doesn't suck. It blows. It's slow. And configuring it is difficult. Uh, there's very little documentation on optimizing NFS. If you've ever looked for it, it's, it's sparse. I mean, it's like the man page says, OK, type this on your export FS line, and that's it. You know, there's, there's very little about it. And so then you start looking at other things like clustered file systems, for example, GFS2, which are better than NFS for things like this at least. Uh, but they have their own issues. I mean, you're going to have to have some sort of back-end server, which may itself be a single point of failure. Uh, you're going to have to have, you know, some way of connecting into those, typically something like iSCSI. And so, again, you're adding a lot more complexity. Uh, wouldn't it be great if we could just reduce the number of web servers we have because, you know, we're not processing but a fraction of what we had before. 
And uh, storing this crap in the database is even worse. You suck the bulletin. Seriously, I've seen a four and a half gigabyte table in the bulletin that was nothing but attachments. Photo attachments of people's fish. That's on one forum. Photo attachments of people's fish, four and a half gigabytes. And this is after the bulletin, you know, reduced the size and stuff. People in Florida catch a lot of fish, folks. <laughs> that was the Florida Sportsman Forum, by the way. So, how do we typically do caching with, you know, traditional things? We typically use things like squid, like this gentleman said. Squid sucks for this. Squid is great for exactly what it was made to do. Squid is made to sit, you know, at your firewall on your, you know, your natted land and to be, you know, a traditional proxy server for all your clients, gathering all the caching content from out on the internet. It is not made to be used as a reverse proxy server. It does not have enough internal logic to be a reverse proxy server. Uh, database caches like Memcache, which we talked about earlier, uh, they have their own issues. So another thing about the traditional proxy servers, it's very difficult to treat users differently when using one. Say your application needs to treat anonymous users one way and authenticated users another way. Maybe the authenticated users are nothing but your editors for your CMS. Maybe there's some users, we don't really know, but with a traditional proxy server, there's really no good logic as to how to handle those users differently. So now we have a better solution, it's varnish. That's the whole reason you came here. Everything else is background that you probably already knew. I just had to go through it again because I had to take up the time in this talk. <laughs> so varnish is incredibly configurable. It's much more configurable than other alternatives. Uh, it's, configura its configuration language is actually sort of a primitive programming language. It's a little C-like. Uh, and it allows us to do logical operations like if this, then do this, else do this other thing, which makes it very powerful because then we can do things like, okay, if the user is authenticated, passing through to the backend server, else let's try and look up an object in cache, for example. So it sits in front of everything and caches the raw HTML. So it sits in front of your web server, it sits in front of your your NFS, it sits in front of your database server, it sits in front of everything and caches everything you tell it to. So none of those systems, if, if, it, if a request hits the cache and the cache is served, none of those systems will be impacted at all. They won't even know a request was made. Now this can have you know, some logging implications. Excuse me, I can't talk. Uh, but it's generally a good trade-off. So let's get into how to actually use Varnish. So each HTTP request that gets received by Varnish, it gets parsed through its VCL, which is the Varnish configuration language. And I'm going to say VCL from now on because Varnish configuration language is a mouthful. And I already got one of those. Uh, so if Varnish has a cached object for the request and the VCL tells it look up from the cache, Varnish will immediately answer the HTTP request. It won't even send anything to the backend server. Uh, if Varnish lacks such an object, it'll direct the, the traffic to the web server and cache the result. Uh, otherwise, it'll pass or pipe, and I'll tell you a little bit more about pipe uh, onto the web server. Is everybody with me so far? Cool. Y'all must be smart. So let's take a look at some simple varnish configuration. This is a configuration for a back-end server. Uh, and my text got wrapped here a little bit. And this is actually somewhat simplified. There are a few other options, but they're all well documented in the man pages. And some of the documentation options online are pretty good. As you can see, we're, we're making the back-end declaration. And it's CMS www01 up here. And the host is 172.16.120.1, and we're on port 80. Uh, connection timeout is 150 seconds, which is pretty long, two and a half minutes. But 
you know, depending on your content, it may or may not be a big deal. And then we have a probe uh, statement. This probe statement is a way that Varnish uh, uses to make sure the backend server is up and running. Because we can have multiple backend servers up, and I'll get into those in a minute. And by probing, you know, Varnish basically checks and says, okay, are you up? Yes, I'm getting a HTTP 200 or whatever. You're up. If I'm not getting a request or if I'm getting some sort of 300 or whatever, maybe I need to take a look and say this particular box is down for now. So, you know, it's basically the request is more or less a simple HTTP request like you could enter with Telnet, get forward slash HTTP 1.1 host example.com, typical headers, and it makes that specific request to the web server. So you don't even have to use a, you know, it doesn't have to be the, the, the document root. You can have something like a, an amilive.php, and it has, you know, if it can do some help checks on the server, and if all those pass, maybe return a 200. Uh, if they don't pass, maybe return some other error code. So you can build some logic into that as to whether or not your system is even alive or not. Can you look at the content of the return as well? Or is it a little better to just use the return code? Good question. I don't know. I think you can, but that's not something I've looked at before. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, and any good question that I don't know the answer for has to be good. Uh, some of the things like OpenNMS, I know like with OpenNMS you can look inside and say, okay, this is, you know, is this content inside the return web page? And I'd suspect Varnish can do that as well, but I, I, I'm not sure. And oh, and for the record, his question was, uh, can you actually look at the content of the web page instead of just the HTTP return code? Uh, so now let's take a look at if we have multiple web servers. And if you're in a larger web environment, this is probably going to be the case. I mean, even with caching, you're probably going to want multiple web servers just for some redundancy. Uh, maintenance is a whole lot easier when you're able to, to take down one web server and, you know, upgrade it, bring it back online, didn't do the other, instead of, you know, doing all this shit at 3 and 4 in the morning when nobody's using your web servers because, you know, I'm tired. I don't like to do that. So uh, Varnish has uh, directors, and those are how we group backend servers together. And it has several different types. There's random, round robin, DNS, and fallback. And there's actually three or four different types of random uh, directors, and I don't really know the, the specific differences between them. Uh, but you know, this is, uh, they, they pick one at random by different, you know, different mathematical formulas. It's not technically random, it's still, you know, uh, logically done, but it's things like a hash of the IP address from the client and things like that. Uh, round robin should be pretty much self-explanatory. It goes to the first one, then it goes to the second one, then the third one, and so on, and then rounds back around. Uh, DNS, I'm trying to remember exactly how it works, but it's similar to round robin. Fallback is interesting. The fallback directory will always use the first backend server that is used, unless for whatever reason it can't. And then it'll use the next one. And it will always use that one until the first one comes back. And if it can't use that one, it'll go to the third one. And this is useful, like say you have one very powerful web server that you want up and running all the time, and you want it to handle every request that it can. And then for backup, you know, as a fallback option, you have a less powerful web server, one that's smaller. It doesn't, it can't make as many uh, requests. It can't handle them all in a timely fashion. But you have it around as a fallback option in case the first one crashes or you have to take it down for maintenance or whatever. Uh, that's when you would want to use the fallback director. Here I've got director awful CMS because all CMSs are awful. 
Uh, that's just the name of the director. And we're telling it we're wanting a round robin. And we're going to use these four back end servers for it. And varnish, we use the first one, and the second one, and the third one, and the fourth one, and round back around. Everybody, that pretty clear? Cool. Let's take a look at some access control lists inside Varnish. Uh, ACLs, I don't personally use them all that much because my particular implementation doesn't need them. But uh, they're basically a way of sort of grouping host names, uh, IP addresses, stuff like that together. As you can see, you know, ACL, local, we have local hosts, we have our private network except for a dial-in router uh, that's all considered local. Maybe, you know, all your editors for this particular CMS web page or whatever will be either on the local host or inside that network. And by making this ACL, we can easily match against that and say, okay, well, these people are local. Let's do something different with them than we do with everyone who's outside of our network. Uh, and then matching is a simple operation. I didn't make a slide about this. And I'm not entirely sure how well you can see it. This here is the tilde character. It's not the equal sign. Varnish can do two different kinds of matches. One is with the equal sign, which is an exact match. And then the tilde is used for ACL matching and regular expression matching. So you don't have to match against you know, an exact definition. You can match against a regular expression, which is very useful with CMSs because you can say, you know, Anything that matches this particular regular expression, like anything under this subdirectory, I want to treat differently than everything else. So, again, you can see a lot more, uh, a lot more uh, logic. And this return code, again, I'm returning pipe, which is a little bit different. You probably wouldn't actually use it in this context, but uh, I'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, I'll explain the differences in the various return codes here. So let's take a look at VCL subroutines. Varnish's config file, it's split among a lot of different subroutines. You can think of these sort of like functions. Uh, if you're familiar with IP tables, you can think of them as different tables like input, forward, output, what have you. Uh, the request will go through different subroutines at different times, and it won't hit all of them, uh, depending on how you logically tell it to go. But I think I've got them all listed on this slide and the next one. VCL init, obviously that's called when you initialize varnish, and it's pretty much only used for things like loading modules. I don't personally use any third-party varnish modules, so I've never used VCL init, but it should be pretty easy. It should be pretty self-explanatory in the documentation how to do it. Uh, VCL receive, that's the one you're going to be working in all the time. That's the one where... Uh, the, the, the Varnish server receives a request from the client. That's the first thing it parses. Uh, it decides whether or not it's going to serve the request. It decides, you know, how it's going to serve it, what back end to use. Inside VCL receive, you can actually do virtual hosting. So you can say things like match host example.com. I want to use this back end server. Match host foobar.org. I want to use this other server. So like Apache virtual host, you can do that inside Varnish. And you can, you know, cache or do things based on the, uh, the uh, host name in addition to the request URL and all sorts of other things. Very powerful. VCL pipe is called when, it's, when you hit return pipe. And that passes requests directly to the backend server. You typically use piping for things like streaming content. Usually with an HTTP request and response, the Varnish server will know how large this request, uh, this response is. It's included in the headers. You know, it says header, size, blah. But with things like streaming media, you don't have that. And so if you just passed, Varnish would eventually terminate the connection. By piping, it just, you know, it, it forwards everything between them and stays open indefinitely. Uh, so if you have your streaming media server, uh, you can still use Varnish and just pipe the content directly to the back end. Uh, if you have videos built into uh, your uh, CMS or maybe like a, uh, 
a live radio stream or something built into your CMS. You can return pipe and still pass all that. It won't get cached, it won't get cut off. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> uh, VCL pass, that's called by return pass. That's when you want to pass the content directly to the web server. Uh, you don't want to serve cached content at all. Like, you know, your editor logs in, you want to return pass for him so that he doesn't get served any cached content. Uh, it just, you know, passes the client request. And VCL hit, that's called whenever a requested object is found in the cache. Pipe, pass, and hit, you might return those codes, but you probably won't be doing too much inside that VCL subroutine. Uh, if you are, it, it's sort of black magic. You're doing something that's very, yes, sir. Okay, so the quest is uh, the question is how do you uh, distinguish between uh, whether a client is logged in or not, and that depends based on your CMS. I'll show an example for WordPress later, but generally you can look at things like content headers. You can look at the cookies inside headers and make your decision based on those. Yes, um, there is a way to, you know, uh, his further comment is lots of times the cookies are encrypted. Uh, and the other gentleman here said, well, usually the value of the cookie is encrypted or it's some sort of hash. And often you can just uh, key on does the cookie exist at all, you know, uh, and if so, pass it. If not, you know, uh, serve it from cash, and that's generally how it's done. The fellow then made a content uh, a comment that, well, someone could just pass this cookie and always go to cash. That is true. Uh, someone could do that. You could also, you know, put in a little third-party module or your own piece of code saying, you know, always use this cookie to sort of, you know, avoid that as much as possible. But generally speaking, uh, I don't know that that's really an issue unless somebody decides they want to try and DOS you uh, or DOS you, you know, something like that. Did you have a question? Just a comment along the same lines. We, we did something similar using uh, F5 load balancers, and we keyed on the presence of the cookie, and then made sure our, our logic in the app on the back end wasn't sending out the traffic that uh, would be confidential data. So, so securing the data, so yes, you're not caching, All right, let's move on to the next few routines. Uh, VCL miss, that's called when uh, a request lookup is done against the cache, and it says, okay, well, I've asked to look up this particular object in cache, you know, this URL or whatever, and I don't have it in cache. So this is where Varnish would do things like go to the web server, uh, request that content, and then cache it. Uh, then there's VCL fit, fetch, fetch. Uh, that's called after an object has been retrieved from the cache. You know, Varnish has talked to the web server, gotten the thing in the cache, and now it's asked to retrieve it. It's asked to do a lookup. It starts to retrieve it. And this is actually before it's delivered. So uh, you also have VCL deliver. Basically, fetch and then deliver is how it's pretty much done. Uh, and that's called before a cached object is delivered to the client. VCL deliver, you might work in some. You can add like your own headers into here with Varnish. Before the request is delivered, you can uh, do some logic that adds in a header, adds in a cookie, adds in something else, or takes out some of those things. Uh, you know, if your backend CMS is, you know, not the nicest thing in the world, and they generally aren't. VCL error and VCL finish, those should be pretty self-explanatory. Error gets called if there's some sort of error. Finish gets called when you discard the VCL. Finish is a little bit different though. You might think finish gets, start, gets called when you restart Varnish. You know, like say you make a configuration change, I want to restart Varnish. I run, you know, 
etc, rc.d, rc.varnish, restart, or init.d, or whatever you're using, but not necessarily. There are ways inside the Varnish admin, and I'll show you that in a little bit, where you can load a new VCL and then switch over to it, discarding the old one without ever restarting Varnish. So there's literally zero downtime. Huh. Uh, and like I said, most of your work will probably be done in VCL receive. Okay, so let's look at some examples, and I told you I'd promise you a WordPress example. And uh, this one I'll be using, suppose for a moment you're using WordPress on your web server, and suppose for the sake of argument that WordPress sucks. Can we all agree on that? Okay. And again, I use the word sucks a lot. It sucks the big one. So we want to cache everything possible, but we still need to pass authenticated users uncached content. These may be our editors, our programmers, people at the work, or, or whoever. Uh, WordPress is nice enough that it includes some cookies that can be used to identify for requests from an anonymous source or an authenticated source. Uh, and we'll always pass certain URLs like login.php, admin, whatever, to the backend server. Uh, you don't want to cache things like login.php because then how the hell do your authenticated users authenticate? Right? Exactly. And I'm actually going to look right here. Okay, first we only want to cache uh, requests for getting head. We don't want to cache post and anything else because why the hell would you, you know? Uh, it's not good to cache post. And I've actually been in some situations where I've done that by accident and uh, got some unexpected behavior out of the CMS. <laughs> oh yeah, it was outstanding. It was outstanding. Mm-hmm. So, anyhow, what I'm doing here, and if you can read this, uh, I haven't gone into detail on what all the different requests and all this sort of thing is, but uh, rec.request, uh, this is something that the client is sending, and it basically is get, head, post, whatever sort of HTTP method. Uh, Request.url is the URL. There's hundreds of these, literally hundreds. And your best bet is to check like man VCL after you compile varnish, man VCL. And you can read through each one and it'll tell you which is available and what subroutines and whatnot. I, I can't really go into all those because we only got another half hour and I don't know all of them. So if a request does not equal a get and it don't equal a head, we're gonna pass it. It's probably a post. We don't want to cache that. Uh, it might be something else like a purge request, which I'll get into later. Uh, and if the request is for WP login, WP admin, we'll pass it too, because we don't want to cache those. Login is actually okay to cache. Because you're already not going to do it. You're already not going to do it yet on the post. Right. But anyhow, that's the way we did it. <laughs> so yeah, screw you. <laughs> I'm giving this talk, man. <laughs> so let's take a look at some cookie management. This is how we're going to uh, differentiate between authenticated and unauthenticated users. And it isn't perfect, but in my experience, it's good enough. Um, so by default, Varnish passes anything that has a cookie attached. If it has a cookie, we're going to pass it. We're not going to try and do an object lookup because Varnish has no idea about what your CMS is doing in the background. It's going to assume that if there is a cookie, it's there for a reason, and it might have some uh, impact on the uh, HTML that gets output. Uh, so by default, it's gonna pass everything that's got a cookie, which in these days and age is pretty much everything with a CMS, right? So if the backend respect Excuse me, if the back end response sets a cookie, Varnish won't cache it either. Uh, so, you know, if you, you know, hit your login page and it sets a new cookie, it's not going to cache that. You want to actually strip those cookies out of the back end response for unauthenticated users. Uh, 
And then you got removal of unnecessary cookies from the request is easily accomplished in VCL receive. Again, this is where you're going to be doing most of your work. Uh, removing uh, unnecessary cookies from the back end is best removed from the CMS code, but as we've seen in earlier slides, the code always sucks, and adding more third party modules and whatnot doesn't make it any better. So you can generally, in like VCL deliver or whatever, pull those out. Uh, in VCL receive, set and unset can be used to remove specific cookies. I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, cookie requests often have more than one cookie, so regular expressions are used to parse out the useless WordPress cookies in the following example, and it's ugly as sent in Sunday school. Uh, here we have set request HTTP cookie equals reg sub all HTTP cookie, WP settings one, ugly stuff, and nothing. So basically what this is doing, it's doing a regular uh, expression substitution on the cookie lines and it's looking for wp-settings-1 equals pretty much anything uh, and then replacing it with nothing. So if you have, you know, five cookies in a line and one of them has to be this one, it will just truncate that one out of there instead of dropping the entire line. Uh, then it does the same with WP settings time, WordPress test cookie, those are the really useless things that WordPress sets. Uh, at this point, if there's any other cookie that has WordPress underscore in it, it's probably a good one like WordPress underscore username, WordPress underscore logged in, something like that. Uh, and that means it's probably an authenticated user and we want to pass their content to the, uh, the web server. And then once we've got past this, if there's any other cookies left in the request, things like Google Analytics or something, we'll drop those and do a return lookup. Uh, it's very easy for Google Analytics because all that's done in JavaScript and they hit you know, Google and we don't have to worry about that. So it doesn't really break anything on the back end. So testing the back end server. Sometimes you want to pass certain requests, not just for one particular page or, or for authenticated users. Sometimes you want to pass unauthenticated users to the back end for things like testing. Maybe you want to load test it, for example. Maybe you've done a code change and things are slowing down a little bit and you want to find out where. Uh, and one easy method for this is to add in your own like HTTP header, like x fetch new equals yes, and client IP is internal. So we can match, you know, that header and against our internal ACL, and if so, we'll pass it. Uh, these following two statements are pretty much functionally equal. Uh, hash always miss true or return pass. They, they'll both get the same thing done. And this will do things like, say you have seeds, you want to seeds test it real quick, or you want to uh, run, you know, open NMS against it, and you want to check the back end instead of just Varnish. Because Varnish might have a cache thing that it's serving for, you know, some long period of time, and your back end server is down for a long time, and say OpenMS doesn't know that because it's not getting passed to the back end. So our first simple VCL, and this is kind of ugly in its simplicity and beautiful at the same time, we're just configuring one back end. We're not doing any sort of probing. We're just telling it, hey, here's our back end. Hey, here's our port. And in VCL receive, we're just going to return a lookup for everything. Everything gets cached. Everything gets looked up. Uh, Varnish will actually append its uh, default VCL receive to the end of this. So it gets some other things added. But this is our basic. It's very simple. Uh, and uh, well, are there any questions about that? I think that's pretty straightforward. Now let's look at purging. Suppose you have something in your cache and you want to get rid of it. You want to pull it out of cache. Say uh, you're caching this uh, page of user uploaded photos. You know, there's a dozen of them on there and then there's an X button or something. Uh, you're caching this and then somebody uploads a new photo and it goes to the front of the line. If you continue to serve that from cache, their photo won't show up until that cache expires, right? You can send a purge request, 
Yeah, screw you too, Robbie. Uh, you can send a purge request and it will uh, eliminate that from the cache. This is similar to Siege's, uh, not Siege's, uh, Squid's purge, if you've ever used that. But basically, uh, you would go like Telnet Varnish Server, and instead of doing a get or a head, you do a purge. And since we're not caching those, again, it gets passed to the back end. Uh, the way we do that inside our VCL, this is inside VCL receive again. If the request is purge, if the client IP is internal, uh, I'm sorry, if the client IP does not equal internal, that's the bang there, we throw a 405 error and say, go to hell. Uh, otherwise, we do a lookup, and that lookup with the purge request strips that out of the cache. And you can put that in your own code so that when the user uploads the photo, it automatically purges it. And so there's no, you know, nothing has to be done additionally. Go ahead. Now, when you wait for the next request that they bring that up, it's going to repopulate the cache. Can you warm your cache in the same statement? Okay, his, quest, his question is a really good one. Um, he says, after you purge this, the next client request is, of course, going to hit the back end server and uh, update the cache. But he's wondering, can you warm the cache up before that next request comes in? The answer is, in current varnish, no, but that's a feature addition they're planning in later versions. Uh, Cache warming is something that I've looked into personally, and there are some hacks out there to get it done, but they're really ugly. Uh, yes, sir. Another question about this is, in Varnish transactional, so if I submit a request, does it get warmed up when I send it to That's a good question. Basically, he's asking if Varnish is transactional so that uh, it will, you know, continue to serve out of, will it continue to serve out of the cache until this uh, purge request is completed? Is that correct? Well, actually, the question is, so when you, when you get the first request, you will purge. Uh, the purge clears the cache. Yeah, right. I guess that, that's part of it, right? So does it continue to serve until it gets a response from it and then update the cache and get a response? It clears the cache immediately and then caches the next response. That's very similar to the warming up. Uh, the idea is that you would purge and then immediately request a new object so that uh, clients never have to hit the back end server. It doesn't currently do that. That's a feature addition that's supposed to come in future versions if they can get it worked out. Correct, correct. And what, what they're actually looking at doing uh, as far as the, uh, the, uh, the warming of the cache is to have some sort of uh, short grace period, maybe 30 seconds or a minute or something, probably not even that long, where it will serve stale content while it's doing a lookup. Uh, there's, there's some, if you go out there and you look on Google, you'll find some people who have managed to get this sort of implemented using just VCL, but it's really ugly, it's really dirty. Uh, and they're hoping to have that in future releases so that, you know, it's very simple. You can say, you know, uh, return, I don't know, warm up or something. Yes? I know you're talking all that, but the way to avoid all that is don't purge in the first place. Just, just uh, expire. If you expire it, then the next time it gets pulled, you get the immediate lookup. You don't go through all that. But how would you expire something in the cache without purging it? Uh, you can actually set the expire time on that object. Uh, I can't tell it to you off the top of my head. I've, I've done it in VCL. It's just cribbing the code from somewhere. What you do is rather than purging, you expire first and then you return a little Hmm. Interesting. So I have to that know. one user, the, the user that would cause the purge, um, yeah, I mean, he's going to end up interfacing with the back end, but he is anyway just by the simple fact he had a purge before you. Right. And usually if you're doing the purge, it's some sort of automated thing anyway. Yeah. Uh, so anyhow, let's move on because y'all are asking questions I don't necessarily know the answer to. Uh, so cache times and grace. Generally, and, and this is where CMSs suck again, 
Uh, varnish will read the cache control headers sent by your CMS and it will cache for the length of time they tell it to cache. Uh, this is sort of like the old expire header except it's better. Uh, the problem is your cache control headers aren't being sent. Uh, I'm not sure about every particular uh, CMS out there, but a lot of them just don't by default send cache control headers and it's messy to get them to do it. Uh, so yeah, uh, generally what you wind up doing is setting some sort of default, you know, 10 minute or something, uh, cache time and for anything that doesn't have a cache control header, because odds are your CMS isn't sending one because your CMS sucks. Uh, so you either have to fix the code uh, or, you know, like I said, set some sort of minimum uh, cache time. And that's generally done with the dash T argument on the command line to varnish. Uh, if you're doing this in Red Hat or something, there's some, you know, Etsy sysconfig varnish where you can set all that stuff up. Uh, but, you know, uh, it's usually in like, yeah, it's, it's seconds, not tenths of seconds. So varnish D dash T 600 will set a default cache minute cache time of 10 minutes. Uh, and additionally, if uh, the backend server goes down, Varnish can continue to serve stale content for a certain amount of time. So if your web server crashes and it's behind Varnish, Varnish can still continue to serve whatever it has in cache for as long as your grace period is set. Uh, I think two hours is what you see on a lot of places online, which should be more than enough time for you to hit, you know, Apache control restart. Uh, I don't know if I have an example of that on the next page or not. I do not. So let's talk for a minute about setting up Varnish. Let me see how much time I got left. Oh, I'm good. I got a little over 10 minutes. Uh, compiling Varnish is straightforward. It compiles real easy. Uh, there's not a whole lot of dependencies. Uh, you, a lot of uh, distros have packages and whatnot for it now. I know it's on slackbuilds.org. There are some source RPMs floating around out there if you don't want to, you know, grab something off fresh RPM or I'm sure there's devs and whatnot too. I really don't care about those though. Uh, you have to get installed on Debian derivative. Yeah, but if you're on a Debian derivative, you know you're brain dead. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yell when the zombies come, we'll see who's left in this right brain. Touche. <laughs> okay, so uh, static comment, comment, static content like images, CSS, those things are rarely ever, you know, change. Uh, they're ideal for caching. Even if you have something that isn't easily cached, like say a forum, which is constantly being updated, uh, you can generally cache things like images, CSS, those sort of things. Uh, other content, you know, it's too dynamic to cache, even for automated users, uh, excuse me, even for uh, unauthenticated users. Why the hell does that say automated? I wish I could automate my users. That would make things so much easier. Uh, slip of the lip, huh? For, you know, like if you have a clock widget or some type on your uh, web server, that, that's probably going to be implemented in JavaScript anyhow, but, you know, just in case. Uh, VCL receive, like we said, it can be configured to look up certain content and always pass it. Uh, it can be configured to always look up certain content in the cache uh, based on things like request.url. You can have things like if request.url matches a regular expression ending in, say, .css or .jpg or .gif or whatever, return lookup, period, no matter what, return lookup. Uh, or, you know, if it matches uh, forward slash do not cache dot php always return pass. Uh, Make sense? So let's take a look at a little bit more of VCL uh, received. This is some stuff I've pulled offline and somewhat modified. Uh, the first thing we're going to do, and this is getting to Grace, if request back end healthy. This is if the back end we're going to be talking to is healthy. Uh, we set the grace period for only 30 seconds. Otherwise, we set the grace period for two hours. Uh, and the grace period is the amount of time after uh, a web server goes unhealthy, after it goes down or gets unresponsive or too slow. 
will say, you know, okay, this stuff may have expired already, but my web server isn't going to give me anything else. I'll serve this for another two hours or whatever. Uh, make sense? Uh, if request URLs do not cache, we'll always pass. If the request URL is, again, login admin, we'll always pass. If request is not a get or hit, we'll always pass. If the request equals WP content themes, these are themes, and request URL is CSS, JPG, blah, 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 we'll unset all cookies, and then later on, uh, it'll get a return lookup. Else, if the request URL is slim images and request URL is a CSS, blah, 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 we'll unset all cookies. We don't care about cookies for CSS, for JPEGs, for images of any kind. Uh, you know, a cookie is not going to affect a PNG file, you know. Uh, if the request is for uh, this particular files directory, we unset all cookies and then we can do a lookup. And without any cookies, it'll be looked up in cache. Make sense? And that may be close to where I'm, uh, still got a little bit more. Uh, this is where we're eliminating the useless cookies like I showed earlier. This is sort of putting everything we've talked about together to some extent. Uh, you know, we're substituting out those particular cookies and, you know, passing based on, uh, I'm sorry, substituting out those cookies and then we check and see, do we still have a WordPress cookie set? If so, we'll pass it. Otherwise, we do a lookup. This return lookup right here, uh, because it's at the end here and there's no, you know, this uh, return pass is inside this, uh, this whole if statement. So, you know, if we're not matching here, we're not matching here, we're not matching here, we're not matching here, finally our default return lookup gets pulled. Make sense? Excellent. And I'm going to the wrong place. So, now we're going to take a look at adding some headers in Varnish. This is in VCL Deliver. Uh, this is, if you remember from our subroutines, this is just before it delivers the stuff back to the client. Uh, this can be useful for your debugging. You know, if object hits greater than zero, we're going to set a header that says X cache hit. Otherwise, we're going to say X cache miss. This can be useful when you're debugging and you say, well, am I getting cache or am I not getting cache? Uh, and it's very easy to look at that header and see. Uh, you can also, you know, if the response, uh, excuse me, if a request uh, varnish TTL, we set the TTL. Uh, we set a header equal to whatever time to live Varnish has for the cache. Uh, our default, if you remember from earlier, is 10 minutes, 600 seconds. This will actually start counting down. It'll get changed every time since it's in VCL Deliver. And remember, VCL Deliver is where we modify things right before we return it to the client. So even if we're hitting from cache, these headers will change. Uh, because we're modifying them inside the varnish after it's been pulled from the, from the cache. So your varnish TTL will start at 600 and it will tick down one second at a time, one second at a time, you know, uh, five minutes later it's at 300. And you know, based on that you can get an idea of how long this is going to stay in cache. Yes, sir? Yeah. But at that point, and his thing, his comment was, since all CMSs suck and they usually don't set the cache control header, he usually sets the cache control header right here in VCL Deliver, uh, which is great as far as things like uh, reverse proxy servers. If the user is behind a reverse proxy server, it'll get cached for that certain amount of time uh, based on that. The, uh, the problem as far as varnish is concerned, this is after it's already been retrieved from uh, cache, so you can't set the cache control header and tell varnish at this point, hey, cache this object. It's after it's already been... No, 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 I'm talking about sending the header to the client so the client's browser cache will right. take that long. Right. And they won't keep breaking the bandwidth. Right, that's what I was saying. Things like the, uh, the traditional proxy server for Squid or, or the browser or whatever. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, Basically, he was saying you can set the cache control header here and they'll keep things like images for whatever thing here and they won't, you know, take up any of your bandwidth at that time unless, you know, they want to refresh for whatever reason. And that's actually a good idea. I should probably do that. I, I got screwed with that with custom CMS recently and there were no cache control headers set and there were like, you know, one net JPEGs 10 to a page. 
Oh God. And and even if it's and even if it's getting served by varnish, that's still ten megabytes of your bandwidth that's getting used. So yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, I had not given that thought. Uh, so varnish includes some command line interface tools, uh, CLI tools. The big one is varnish admin. Uh, that's your management interface. You can go in and do things like load a new VCL, switch over to a VCL switch back, restart, all kind of junk like that, check the status. Uh, and I'll show you a brief subset of the things you can do in that uh, soon. Varnish log is sometimes run from the command line, sometimes run as a daemon. Uh, it's basically logging for varnish. And it gives you, if you're used to Apache logs, varnish logs look way different. Uh, it splits up and, and I really don't have an example of those. I probably should have brought it, but they're, they're not a long string like they are with Apache or Nginx logs or whatever. They're uh, a lot of very short strings and it's generally put in like some sort of table. It looks like, uh, it looks a lot like the uh, HTTP headers from a request actually, uh, along with some things like, well, did we hit deliver, did we hit pass, uh, are we fetching at this point, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and, you know, varnish log can be directed to a file. It can, you know, be directed to your console, whatever. Uh, varnish top, that can be interesting uh, and useful at some times. It's a real-time list of the most common log entries. Uh, you'll probably see things like git forward slash up towards the top. Uh, uh, you know, maybe post somewhere along in there. Uh, and that's, that's kind of nice because you can take a look at it and glance and see, well, what's getting hit the most. Uh, varnish hist is not history, it's a histogram. And uh, it's basically a, a, a real-time histogram of the cache hits and misses. So it you know, will show you hits going up on one side, misses going up on another side, and it's kind of a, a gooey sort of cacti sort of thingamabob. Uh, and the same for varnish stats, uh, real-time statistics for varnish, they're very similar. And I think my last slide here is a little bit more in-depth on varnish admin. This is not a complete list of the varnish admin uh, things, but it hits the highlights, things like status, uh, startup varnish, stop varnish, uh, VCL load. Like say you make a change or you uh, make a change in your VCL config file, you can load up a new uh, VCL here, and then later on we'll use VCL use to switch over to it. So say, you know, I want to test something out. I want to test passing this particular URL, and I don't want to, you know, reload directly to it. I can uh, use VCL load, my config file name, and then some file name for VCL, like, I don't know, today's date, test, pass. And then later on, I can use VCL use, today's date, test, pass, and it'll switch over to that particular VCL. And if it doesn't work, I can switch right back to the old one. Uh, VCL discard gets rid of the old ones. Uh, VCL inline, hell, I don't remember how to use that. Uh, VCL list shows you all the VCL options you got. Uh, VCL show will show the specific uh, uh, VCL implementation you mentioned. Uh, banning is similar to purging. Remember how we talked about you could go into, uh, you could send an HTTP purge request and get rid of certain things? Well, banning is like that, except you can do a regular expression match. You know, when you're doing a purge, it's basically an HTTP method call. You know, your purge forward slash foo.php. Here we can do ban URL star.php or dot star or pig, whatever, you know. You can match anything by regular expression, it'll it'll get rid of it. Uh, you can also ban is that keep it from coming back in? No, and that's that's a nomenclature problem. Uh, probably because these were made by Norwegians or something. And that, that threw me up the first time. His question is that ban, does that keep it from coming back in cache? No, it just gets rid of the current cached objects that match this. So like say you've got a dozen websites, uh, which we have hundreds of them, 
uh, and you're making some change on your back end config, you know, you're uploading some things and you want to uh, change everything for that one host name, like say Guns and Ammo. Uh, it's one of our websites. You can do uh, ban uh, request.http.host like guns and ammo, and it will ban guns and ammo.com, it'll ban www.gunsandammo.com, uh, foo.gunsandammo.com, anything that matches that will get pulled out of cache. Technically, it stays in cache, but uh, the next time a request is made, it updates the cache. Uh, you know, it sends that request, passes it through, and updates. And band.list will show you all your current list of bands. And, you know, eventually they expire out and whatnot. So are there any other questions? I think we got about 15 seconds, so it better be a short one. What's your name again? Alan Hicks. The Alan Hicks is how it's listed in your program guide on the last page. Any other questions? We're about one minute over now. Okay, apparently I'm so awesome I've stunned y'all into silence. So if there's no further ado, I'd like to go eat lunch. Uh, you can leave your tips right here. Uh, <laughs>
The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any asterisk or switch fox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication. From Wicked. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. 
Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it. Uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the CloudStack.